Hi, right, welcome back. Uh, if you'll recall, last week we were talking about solenoids. And this week we're going to move on, continue on the same set of slides, and we're going to begin with relays. We have kind of a lot to cover and not a whole lot of semester left, so I may be moving a little bit more quickly than uh, what we're accustomed to. But I don't want to skip over things and I don't want to uh, blow by things without really explaining them. So that's always the challenge. Um, I just want to remind you of your opportunity whenever we're in the shop, uh, you can ask me questions. If things on this don't make sense to you, if you don't understand, you can ask me. Now, most of you, we already in the shop went through an explanation of relays. Uh, I know I did that with several sections of the lab. I brought out a relay that was cut apart and we looked at it. If you were not in one of those sections, it's because uh, there was some sort of live work to do. There was um, a project that was going on, uh, like that Pro Charger, for example. So there wasn't really time for the demo, but um, I'm certainly willing to do that. Anybody that's missed any, any kind of demo that I've done, um, I'm happy to do that for you. That one didn't take a whole lot of time, but it was a, an explanation of how relays work. I'm kind of going to be repeating that only without the uh, hands-on portion of it, right? I can't hand you a relay or show you it working. So I'm gonna have to just try to do it with wiring diagrams and explanations. After relays, we'll move on to uh, data streams, we'll move on to lamps and indicators, and then various kinds of motors. And I wanna wrap up this set of slides pretty quickly uh, between this week and next, so that then we can have our second test. So let me uh, bring up Blackboard here. And we'll go to the course like we always do. I like to start right from the start so you know where to find things, right? We're gonna pick uh, AU272. Any section doesn't matter, they're all the same. And under lessons, we have uh, the slides from week nine, the, the third slides, third set. So if I click on that, then uh, we can open it. And we can see where we were. We were uh, talking about outputs and we only got through solenoids. And, and I think the reason we only got through solenoids, there's a lot to talk about with solenoids. So that, that video went over an hour and uh, we talked about different types of controls like um, you know duty cycle and pulse width modulation. So we're gonna move on to relays now. So we went through direct and direct control, power ground side switching. We talked about solenoids. We talked about duty cycle. We talked about pulse width and leaves us here. So in the last uh, video, I talked about direct and indirect control of a device. And the difference here really is indirect control, there's gonna be a relay involved. What a relay does, it uses a small amount of current to control a large amount of current. The reason we would do this is we're controlling a lot of things by computer nowadays. Computers have very, very tiny parts inside them. They don't handle a lot of current easily. So um, we use the computer to control the relay. Now a relay doesn't require a lot of current to operate. But when the relay does operate, the switch inside the relay can carry a lot of current. So we're kind of taking the, the job of carrying a bunch of current, we're offloading it from the computer and putting it on the relay. All the computer has to do is control the relay, which is kind of a low current thing. So a lot of things are controlled by relays and typically it's anything that draws a lot of current. So electric motors, big deal, fuel pump, power windows, cooling fan, you know, these things, uh, they draw 15, 20, 30 amps. The starter, Starter draws 100, 200 amps. That all depends on size of the engine, uh, how cold it is, how thick the oil is. You know, there's a lot of variables there, but it's definitely at least 100 amps uh, spinning over a starter. And so um, that's a big relay for that. We're going to talk about two types, a four pin and a five pin, and we're going to talk about the ways they can fail. So for that, I'm going to bring up the wiring diagram I was using last week. And uh, 
So that, and I'm struggling here between going too old and going too new. So kind of settling on this 10 year old Chevy. Some things have changed, but uh, most things, obviously electricity still works the same. And the, the one thing I like about the uh, older wiring diagrams is they show more detail about kind of what's going on inside the computer. The newer ones, they've kind of dumbed them down. Uh, so we're going to go with the 2010 for that reason. And I'm going to go, uh, let's see, we'll go to original equipment electrical diagrams. Uh, the non OE ones, those are nice, but you may not always have access to those. The OE ones, at least, uh, if you have any kind of shop manual, you should have that, right? So let's start with cooling system and go to engine cooling. And the reason I like this one is because it has a couple different kinds of relays. Let's start right here with fan one relay. And we'll use this to talk about the basics of relay operation. First thing I wanna call your attention to is that the relay is really split into two sides. There's the control side, and then there's the load side, okay? So the control side over here, that's handling a small amount of current. That is an electromagnetic coil with kind of a lot of resistance. So current flow through here uh, is probably less than an amp. Over here is essentially switch contacts inside the relay, and that can handle a lot of current depends on how big the relay is, but it can handle 10 amps, 20, 30, 40, uh, you know, the kinds of loads that we might get with a cooling fan motor. And if you look uh, to, let's see, let me get rid of this here a minute. If you look at this dashed line here, that kind of indicates that this magnet has an effect on this switch, right? So. Essentially, when this magnet is energized, you know, it causes this switch to close and current to flow through the relay. All right, next thing I want to draw your attention to, these numbers, 86, 85, 30, 87. Now, these are not uh, General Motors numbers. In fact, they're not even automotive numbers. They're not circuit numbers, right? What's a circuit number on a car wiring diagram? Right here, circuit 335, circuit 504, right? So that's not what these are. They're also uh, not pin numbers on a, on a GM wiring diagram necessarily, right? This is, you know, a pin number. These numbers here, the uh, 85, 86, 30, and 87, those are kind of an electrical standard, been around forever. And they, they have meaning. Um, typically, the way this works, 85 and 86 identify the control circuit. Sometimes these pins, if you pull a relay out of the a relay box and you look at the bottom, and you see the pins, you know, that this one's got four of them, right? Um, you'll notice that those pins might be smaller than the other two pins. Uh, reasoning being, you know, they're not carrying a lot of current, right? So um, 30 and 87, right? Those typically identify the load side of the relay, the higher, higher amperage, the higher current. So um, they may be bigger terminals. Again, uh, your mileage may vary. It's it's not always that way. They might all be the same size. Depends on what this relay is doing. So essentially what happens is when current flows through the control side circuit, the electromagnetic field then pulls the switch closed and current flows through the low side circuit. Last week we talked about power and ground side switching. So if you notice, uh, the switching takes place right here 
in the uh, engine control module for this relay. And you can see that's a symbol there for a ground. And this is a symbol for a switch. And like we talked about last week, that doesn't mean that this is, you know, a mechanical switch inside there. I'm sure it's a transistor, but that's the function it does. That's why I like these older wiring diagrams. They kind of show you the internal, you know, function that's happening in the, um, in the wiring diagram, right? So the control side here has power from the powertrain relay. That's another thing, but it's power. It's battery voltage through fuse um, emission two, 15 amp fuse. And that feeds more than one thing, right? If you look at splices and, you know, it feeds this relay, but it also goes over and it feeds this one and it goes over and it feeds that one. So, um, don't think that this relay requires 15 amps to operate. So when the uh, PCM, right, when the PCM decides that it's time to energize that relay and, and make a fan go on or something like that, right, it's just going to create the ground down here. It's going to connect this circuit to ground, and that's going to cause this relay to come on and the fan's going to run. So that's your typical four pin relay. Um, we'll come back to that one in a little bit uh, when we talk about relay diagnosis. But let's let's make this one front and center now, okay? Fan two relay. Um, fan three relay is pretty much identical to fan one, right? But uh, fan two, that's a little bit different, right? This one. It's, uh, if you notice, it has five pins, right? So it has our normal control side, 85, 86, that we're used to already. And then it has 30 and 87, just like, just like the four pin relay over here, right? But it also has 87A. Now, what the heck is 87A? So this goes to the idea of, of a normal position. When something's shown on a wiring diagram, it's shown in its de-energized or normal position. So on this relay, when the uh, control side is not energized, so the switch is spring-loaded over to this position, which means that any current coming in through pin 30 would go out pin 87A. Now, when you energize the relay here, then that current, instead of going out 87A, right, now it's going to go out pin 87 because the switch is going to flip over because of the magnetic field here. So this is an either or relay, the five pin relay. Sometimes you'll see a five pin relay, but when you look on the diagram, or even when you look at the bottom of the relay or the socket that the relay plugs into, you'll see that 87A is not used, even though it exists. So that's kind of a common thing to use a five pin relay where you only need four and 87A just isn't connected to anything. Um, so it just works the same as a four pin relay here. 87 becomes hot when the relay is energized. Okay. So that, that's a basic explanation of the relay and, you know, how the relay operates and what it does. These, if you notice, all of these relays. Nope, 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 nope. I take that back. These two, one and two, they are controlled on the ground side right here. That's what controls the, the uh, current flowing through pins 85 and 86, the control side of the relay. Uh, if I go to um, the fuel pump, and I know we've been here before last week. We'll go to powertrain management. And if we go to the fuel pump relay, all right, where are you? No, 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 no. Here we go. Fuel pump relay. 
uh, if you remember, it had a ground uh, all the time, and the engine control module controlled power side of it going out. Got to move that down. You see, pin 85 becomes connected to power when the ECM wants it to. Pin 86 is always connected to ground. So let's go back to that cooling fan one a minute. Let's see, go back. And let's talk about relay diagnosis because this is actually kind of great. Let's keep it simple. We'll just deal with uh, the left cooling fan. Uh, now, let me find a different relay diagram. Let me find actually, uh, just for the purposes of this, let me change to a different vehicle. And I'm going to go really old because it's a car that we had in the shop that you guys have all seen. Um, so that 2001 Ford, Crown Vic, and look at the cooling fan on that. OE, uh, let's see, cooling system, do we have cooling system? We have cooling system. Cooling fan relay. Okay, there's two of them. There is a low relay and there's a high relay. So there's low, there's high. And if you notice the fan motor has, you know, two poles. Um, if you energize this pin, it's gonna run at low speed. If you energize that pin, it's gonna run at high speed. So this one only goes around maybe half the windings inside that motor. This one goes around all the windings inside that motor. A little strange, but you know, it works. So let's see, what do we have? We have power in starter run, uh, fed on this circuit 361, the red wire, two pin 86 of the cooling fan relay. Now notice I said, remember I said these are, a um, couple of things I said earlier that we can kind of look at here. I said that these numbers, 85, 86, 30, 87, those are kind of standard. So we're seeing the same thing on a 2001 Ford that we saw on a 2010 Chevy, right? Same numbering. Um, it's just a standard. You might even see those numbers on the relay itself. When you pull the relay out and look at it, it may have those numbers stamped onto it. So notice it says, you know, right here, it says 12 volts on pin 86. And then we have uh, the ground controlled here by the powertrain control module. Solid state just means there's no moving parts, right? It's all electronic. So pin 28, they're not showing you like on that Chevy weighing diagram, they're not showing you what happens inside here, but trust me, it's a ground that happens inside there when the PCM uh, is energizing that relay. Pin 28, of the PCM becomes a ground. Ground circuit 229, the red and orange wire. Current flows through our relay coil, right? And uh, that magnetic field then pulls the switch contacts and connects 30 and 87 together. So those become connected. Here's another thing I talked about, right? I talked about sometimes a five pin relay is used, but the fifth pin doesn't do anything. Here's a perfect example of that. Pin 87A exists, but what's it connected to? It's not connected to anything. It's just hanging out in space, right? So they used a five pin relay. They're only using four of the pins. Pretty common and not surprising. Same thing over here, the high relay, you know, now they're they're labeling the pins on this diagram. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, five, six. I don't know where pin four went. So, um, but pin six, which would be 87A in, in standard, uh, you know, terminology, that's not connected to anything either. So when this relay is de-energized, uh, there's a connection here, but it doesn't go anywhere, right? Just this is 
nothing. So nothing is on, right? Until it uh, closes and connects this pin three to pin five, right? And then power comes out circuit 638. All right, so enough of that. I want you to imagine that the cooling fan doesn't work. And what's really nice, um, what's really nice is that the relay is a great place to do your diagnosis from. Here's why. You can pull this relay out, set it on the bench, and what you're looking at, where that relay came out, you're looking into four pins, four female pins in a fuse relay center somewhere. And those pins give you access to the entire circuit. Here's what I mean by that. I can see by this diagram, right, that pin 30 should have 12 volts at all times, right, through this 30 amp circuit breaker. So if I take a voltmeter or a test light, and I'm going to recommend voltmeter when you're dealing with anything controlled by a computer, because test lights can have too high of a current draw and do damage. So you take a voltmeter and you check this pin, not on the relay, this pin in the relay box with the relay out and sitting on a bench somewhere. It should have 12 volts. If it does, then you can just forget all about this entire one fourth of the circuit, right? Because here's what I'm doing. I'm taking this circuit and I'm saying we can divide it into four quadrants. We have uh, a dividing line here, this side over here, this is the control side, right? And this side over here, that's the load side. Let me put that there. So control and load, right? So we split the circuit in half. Now we can do it again. Um, this way, right? And so, you know, we can just say we have a quadrant here, 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 and here. And our diagnosis is just going to try to eliminate those as the possible problem. So back to where we started, if I have 12 volts here at pin 30 at all times, I can forget this entire part of the circuit. That's not where the problem lies. Of course, if I don't have power at 30, I've already found the problem, right? It's somewhere up in this uh, circuit. So now I move on. What does it tell me uh, pin 86 should have? 12 volts. Now that's a little more complicated uh, because when does it have 12 volts? Well, it should have it in start or run, right? So it's going to come through the PCM power relay, down circuit 361 to the cooling fan relay. Assuming that I have my 12 volts here, right? Then I can just forget this entire quadrant too, right? I can forget there's no problem here, there's no problem there, this splice is okay, this wire is okay. Um, you know, the PCM power relay is okay. All of that's working. I can forget everything up here, forget it. That's not where my problem lies. So I've just now, remember I had the circuit divided uh, in half, right? I have just eliminated the entire upper half of that circuit. Cross it off, that's not where the problem is. How long did that take me? I'm standing at the, the uh, fuse slash relay center with a voltmeter in my hand. I touch, two pins, right? I touch this one, I touch this one. They both have 12 volts. That's taken me about eight seconds, right? I spent more time getting the voltmeter out of the box and I have eliminated 50% of the circuitry uh, for that system. That's not the problem. Great. Now, how do I eliminate uh, the rest of this? So, there's more than one way to do this, okay? So I, let's let's do it this way. What happens if you connect the uh, clip or the or the um, I'm sorry, the red voltmeter lead 
to battery positive, right? And then you touch a ground. What does the meter read? The meter reads battery voltage. So what if I take my meter, right? So this is going to be horrible. My apologies. But, you know, here's my voltmeter. And here's my little screen inside the voltmeter. And then I've got uh, I've got a dial of some sort. Um, let's see, I can find myself an oval or a circle, right? I have a circle. Put that there. So there's my voltmeter, and uh, so I have it set to DC volts. So it's switched to DC volts there, right? I have uh, the red lead of the meter going off to battery positive. I just took it to the positive battery terminal. Now, if my black lead um, touches a ground, my meter's gonna read 12 volts, right? So I still have the relay out sitting on the bench. I take my black meter lead and I put it here where that relay plugs in to pin 85. Now, if circuit 229, if that becomes a ground, right, my voltmeter is going to read 12 volts. And when the ground goes away, what's it going to read? It's going to read uh, zero volts. Right? So how do I make uh, circuit 229 become a ground? I take a scan tool. I go into, uh, you know, device control on that scan tool. And I turn on that cooling fan low relay with the scan tool. What does that do? That makes the powertrain control module here create a ground on pin 28, grounding circuit 229. If my voltmeter changes, goes from nothing, right, to 12 volts, that tells me that that circuit's working. It's working fine. This circuit here has become a ground. I can now, right, I can take this entire, right, this quadrant of the, you know, here's my, my circuit divided into four quadrants. I can take this whole quadrant, I can forget it. That's not where the problem lies. I can eliminate circuit 229, I can eliminate connector 103, I can eliminate, uh, you know, the PCM, um, all of this, it's working fine. Because when I energize that really with the scan tool, my meter changes from zero to 12 volts because circuit 229 becomes a ground. How long did that take? Not very long. All right, now I had to go hook up a scan tool or whatever the fuck. So the last one here is we have to test circuit 228 uh, and the cooling fan, right? How can I do that? And I wanna recommend some caution here. Typically what they'll tell you is they'll tell, tell you to get a fused jumper wire. So a jumper wire, put a fuse in it, uh, just in case you make a bad connection or if there's a short somewhere. And the relay is still on the bench, remember. I have battery voltage here at this pin and this pin here, goes to my cooling fan. If I take a jumper wire and right there in the relay box with the relay removed, I connect these two pins together with that jumper wire, that should send power down circuit 228 to the fan. So let's try that. I connect with the jumper wire, I hear the fan run. What does that tell me? Well, it tells me a lot, right? What does it tell me is good? Circuit 228 is good. Um, 
connector 109 here is good. The cooling fan is good. Circuit or connector 109, this pin, circuit 57, black, ground 102. Those are all good. I'm listening to the fan run. So everything down this down this line, right? From here on down, it's all good. What have I done? I've taken another quadrant, right? So we had we had four quadrants, right? I've eliminated that one because I had 12 volts here. I eliminated this quadrant because I had 12 volts uh, here, right? I eliminated this quadrant because I got a ground on circuit 229 when I used the scan tool. And now I've eliminated this quadrant because when I feed power into circuit 228, I hear my cooling fan run, telling me the fan works, the wiring to the fan works, the ground at the fan works, it's all good. What does that leave? I've eliminated everything except for the relay. What's bad on this car? The relay is bad. I haven't really moved my feet, right? I'm standing at that relay box uh, and I can access all four quadrants, all the wiring involved in that cooling fan relay, all from the same spot without having to crawl under anything or I don't have to find the fan and the electrical connector at the fan. I don't have to see if there's power at the fan unless, right, unless one of these tests fails. If I jumper uh, 30 to 87 and I don't hear the fan run, now, now I got to figure out, okay, is it circuit 228, right? Is it the fan? Is it the ground? You know, so I have to go to the fan now, probably. But that's only uh, if that part of the test fails. So I'm saving myself a whole lot of time diagnosing from uh, where the relay is. So what have we talked about? Let me go back to, uh, let me go back to our slides here. What I missed. Um, okay, the only thing I missed is the uh, the bottom point here, right? That they can also fail in two, two ways. Now, when I say also, uh, I'm comparing that to a solenoid. We said solenoids can fail electrically or mechanically. So back to this. What can go wrong uh, with a relay? If I'm looking at the relay itself, not the wiring. This is a, a coil of wire. A coil of wire can break, burn, uh, pins can corrode. You know, I can have electrical issues here. I may be able to check that with an ohm meter if I can find a spec. More likely, I'm going to find an identical relay that I can compare it to. So if this coil is shot, it really is not going to click, okay? Um, and so it's dead. Here's a big caution. Just because the relay clicks, okay, just because you hear the physical connection happen between 30 and 87, those, uh, you know, relay contacts physically touch together and, and you hear it, that doesn't mean the relay is good. What can happen, right, is um, inside the relay, these contacts can become corroded or burned. And just because they're touching doesn't mean they're carrying any current. So you really have to either use an ohm meter or you have to hook a, a light bulb or some sort of a load to absolutely verify that it can carry current, not just make a noise, right? Here's another big caution, and this can screw you up. Not all relays are actually relays inside. Um, some of them do not actually have moving parts. Instead, they use a switching uh, transistor. And so you will never hear them click. Um, so if you're just using the click test, right? And I don't know, so I didn't say that here. If you're just using the click test, the fact that you don't hear it click doesn't mean anything on that kind of a relay. What about replacing that relay with another one from the car? And this is a, a very valid uh, 
you know, diagnostic operation, but you have to be careful. Relays can look alike, but be different internally. So just make sure they usually have a number stamped on them. But I've done this a hundred times, you know, the, the horn won't work. Uh, it uses the same number relay as the cooling fan. I pull the cooling fan relay out, stick it in where the horn relay belongs. The horn works. Okay, I know it's the relay, right? Just trying to know good part. Uh, it's good diagnostics as long as you're you're sure that it's the same actual part number. Let's move on. We've now talked about relays. Had to get some light on there. Uh, sitting in the dark so again we've we've now talked about relays in quite a bit of detail and like i say we did this in the shop too if you didn't happen to be in that lab when that happened uh you should probably ask me to to show you that because seeing it really makes it make a lot of sense if you have any questions about relays you know how they operate how to diagnose them what they're there for how they're controlled hopefully this answered all of that Relays are used all over the car. They're used in all kinds of different systems. Like I said, they can be, you know, powertrain. They can be, uh, you know, fuel pump relay. They can be a uh, power relay. They can be a, like uh, Chrysler, the automatic shutdown relay. Um, they can be power windows, power door locks, cooling fan, air conditioning, compressor clutch. Anytime there's a pretty good sized electrical load that needs to be controlled by a computer, you're going to find a relay. Here's one last little picture, you know, a little simplified diagram. Uh, the relay coil. So that's, you know, pins 85 and 86. And then the relay actual switch contacts, pins 30 and 87. And, you know, you have a uh, little transistor inside the computer controlling the current to that relay coil. That transistor cannot necessarily handle a lot of current. so. It can't control the fuel pump directly, but it can certainly control the relay. Here's something I missed. Shocking, right? I missed something, but I did. Let's go back. I'm back on the 2010 Chevy. Uh, and I just see if it's on this one. I don't remember if I saw it. Yeah, it's not on here. Okay, let me go back to the, uh, let me go back to the board a minute. Doesn't mean the Chevy doesn't have it. It just means they're not showing it on the diagram. So that's the thing, these diagrams, are, they're not all exactly the same. Let's go back, let's try compressor clutch. Um, compressor clutch. Where's a relay? Find me a relay. There's a relay. There's a uh, AC compressor clutch relay. This looks exactly like the other relays we looked at, right? Nothing different. Pin 85, pin 86, pin 30, pin 87, and then an absolutely useless pin 87A. Five pin relay used uh, where only four are needed. But the thing that I didn't talk about, that I want to talk about, is right here. Okay, they're showing uh, a little symbol for a resistor. And uh, sometimes instead of a resistor, that's a diode, it's called a clamping diode. Now, why do we need a diode or a resistor in that relay on the coil circuit? Back uh, in engine performance, when we talked about um, when we talked about ignition coils, or back in electrical, when you talked about um, alternators, possibly I didn't teach you electrical, so I'm not sure exactly. And what you got. So back then, 
you heard about something called electromagnetic induction. And that's where you're using the magnetic field to create electricity. And you know, an ignition coil creates a whole lot of electricity, really high voltage, because it energizes a coil, the primary windings of an ignition coil, lets that magnetic field build up and then suddenly cuts it off, right? Turns off the current through that coil. What happens? You get a very big voltage spike out of that ignition coil. You get a huge voltage spike from the secondary windings, but also those primary windings get, uh, they get a pretty good spike too. So let's go back to that, uh, let's go back to this diagram. This is a big coil wire. It becomes energized when that relay is turned on. When the PCM turns that relay off, right, it, it ungrounds pin 85 right here. There is, when this magnetic field around this coil collapses, right, there's a pretty good spike looking for somewhere to go, right? If we let that spike hit the computer, it might be 100, 200 volts. If we let that hit the computer, what happens to this computer? Boom, it's, uh, it becomes a boat anchor, right? So we don't wanna let that happen. A clamping diode or this resistor, what they do is they allow that voltage spike to go somewhere else, right? Clamping diode, clamping, you know, a resistor is to protect against voltage spikes to the PCM. So um, if you measure the resistance on this coil, you're you're getting a parallel circuit here, right? Not just the coil. If you get a resistor or a relay that has a diode instead, it's going to measure different in one direction than it does in the other. So these are just things to be aware of. Is there anything you can do about it? No, there, there isn't really. Right. Another thing I want to mention, um, last year when we suddenly had to leave the building, you know, when uh, COVID started, uh, I was then forced to quickly come up with a bunch of uh, lessons to do online, like we're doing now. And, uh, those are still out there on YouTube. So if you search, you know, AU273, right? If I, uh, if I fire up YouTube, and there's a channel there, AU273. And there are videos here. Some of you subscribe. In fact, you know, Davion just described, subscribe today, I think. Um, I have, uh, if you go towards the bottom here, going back to last semester, right? I'm talking about solenoids here. Um, and I was doing labs basically on video in the classroom because we couldn't do any online stuff. So, you know, feel free to watch these too. Uh, see 11 months ago, right? Where I was talking about all kinds of different stuff. And then there's other stuff you, you might, uh, the side is interesting, right? That um, air conditioning stuff too. But I just wanted to point out that stuff is available, right? Uh, let's see. I don't think I was sharing that. <laughs> let me let me bring that up again, just in case. Now I I could look, but then I'd have to actually. Um, I can't get the little WebEx controls out of the way. There we go. Try again. So on YouTube, uh, this this AU273 lab channel, you can just search AU273. And there, there they all are, right? So a year ago, 11 months ago, 10 months ago, this was all last spring things that I had to do uh, kind of quickly. Um, there's last semester stuff, 
body of people might have been in that. Well, maybe not. Okay. So when I go back to edit this, I guess I'll see whether I just showed you the same thing twice. I don't know. Um, let's move on. I'm going to uh, bring up the next. Come on, I don't want this. Hello, there we are. All right, the next set of slides. So data streams, the next topic we're going to talk about. Completely new topic here from Relays. Keyboard forward is wrapped around my feet. All right, there we go, that's better. So what is a data stream? Now we talked about this when we talked about inputs, uh, that you know it's a bunch of electrical pulses sent from one computer to another that enables communications between them. It's not human readable. You know, if you watch these signals on a meter or a scope, they would mean nothing to you. They're too fast for one thing. Um, but they allow computers to share sensor information. They allow computers to share all kinds of information. They allow uh, communication to scan tools. And most cars nowadays have multiple networks, different kinds of networks, different speeds of networks. And those networks are usually connected to each other. So you might have a low speed can, a high speed can, or medium speed can, and high speed can. Um, and there are some modules that are on both. So they can, those networks that can talk to each other. This uh, data link connector, this is an old slide. This is out of a book we used to use. So instead of this, let's do real life. I'm back to that 2010 Impala. Let's go to the diagram. Uh, actually, let me back up. Let's go to connector views. And under connector views, uh, let's see. Data link connector. Okay, so this is where your scan tool plugs in, as you know. And let's talk about what's on this car, right? So they all have 16 pins eight on the top, eight on the bottom. And some of these are common to every single data link connector. For example, pin 16, uh, this is always gonna be battery voltage. Not all scan tools have batteries. So you plug a scan tool in, it gets its power from pin 16. A lot of times that is connected to a lighter fuse or a horn fuse. And so if, uh, if that fuse pops, you can't talk to your scan tool. So down here is a pinout for this car. Like I said, some of these are standardized. All, all cars have the same ones. And so example, you know, that pin 16 battery voltage, uh, these grounds, pretty standard. Um, pretty common, six and 14 is high speed. Now GM says GM land, but let me tell you what that actually is. That is, uh, CAN. That's just GM's name for their version of CAN, right? Which stands for Controller Area Network. Right? They call it GM LAN, high speed GM LAN. And notice uh, here we have a pin one. Come on, where is it? I don't seem to want to work. There it is. Low speed uh, CAN. Not uncommon for vehicles to have multiple CAN networks. So that's the data link connector. It's better than my slide, right? My slide is dated. But I do want to point out um, that some of these are SAE sort of mandated pins, right? But others, like pin one, pin three, pin six, right? It says manufacturer discretionary. So what that means is that the car manufacturer is allowed to use these pins for whatever they want. Uh, maybe they have their own network just for ABS and they wanna use pins 11 and 12. They can do that. Not saying they do, but, but that's not against the rules. Let's go back to the actual diagrams now for this 2010 Chevy Impala. 
original equipment electrical diagrams and i am going to go to where is it under i information bus here we go so information bus is another word for the network and this is uh interesting there's different things to look at let's start at the top notice this says data link connector Pins four and five on the data link connector, what do they do? They connect right down to ground, ground 201, ground 202. Pin one on the data link connector connects to this junction. This is a uh, actual removable junction connector. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And pin 16, like on every other vehicle, connects around to uh, battery voltage. This one uses the display fuse 10 amp, right? So if that fuse pops your scan tools, you're not going to get any power off of pin 16. All right, let's talk about pin one. This is how your scan tool can access this network. What is this network? This is the uh, low speed GM LAN, which I already told you what's GM LAN. That is General Motors own term for controller area network or PAN, right? Okay, so that's the diagram we're looking at. So, so this is not a fast network and it doesn't have to be. I'll give you an idea why, right? Look at what we're doing, radio, body control, HVAC, theft deterrent, these do not require, you know, exactly real time um, or high speed communications. It's, we're still talking, you know, uh, kilohertz or megahertz. I don't remember what I, I have a chart, but it's, it's not, um, it's not slow. It's just lower speed than the high speed one. And it's simpler. So we're talking lower cost, right? And if you notice, this network, every computer comes back to a central point. What do I mean by that? Body control module comes back to here. Radio comes back to here. Instrument panel cluster comes back to this point. Remote control door lock receiver, back to this point. Theft deterrent, back to this point. So what they call this is they call this a star configuration. Let me get myself a little room to draw. And so star configuration because everything comes together to a central point. Doesn't really look like a star, but it all comes to a central point. This is kind of how uh, networks in a building work. Um, you plug your PC, you know, if you're a wired network, into the wall, they all go back to a hub somewhere in a closet somewhere. So notice, you know, the uh, vSIM, the heated seat control module. Again, these are not things that require, you know, lightning speed, right? Um, they, they all come back to this, eventually they get to this central point um, of this junction connector. And so they can all talk to each other through that. They can also talk to the scan tool. How do they talk to other modules that are not on this low speed network? Well, you're going to notice, right? And I'm not sure which, but I suspect that the body control module, uh, you know, possibly the cluster are on this network, but they're also on the other network. Therefore, uh, you know, all of these networks can communicate with each other as needed. That's just all in the design of the network. Let's talk a minute about what the heck is this, right? What does it mean? U2K UE1 KE1 or minus U2K UE1 KE1. This is a with or without option sort of thing, right? So if the vehicle has certain options, uh, this stuff exists, right? Without those options, this wire just goes straight through. In other words, see, that's what this is really showing. It's just showing, you know, this going straight on through 
without any of this, the splice doesn't exist. So what is U2K, UE1, KE1? I talked about this in the lab, but it's worth talking about again. We'll go to the vehicle level, right? And uh, application and ID. Somewhere um, is a service parts ID label. And that service parts ID label looks like this, only instead of just a blank space here, there are a whole bunch of letters and numbers. And what do those letters and numbers mean? Those letters and numbers are RPO codes, regular production option codes. This is a General Motors thing. So uh, they're, they're alphanumeric. In other words, they're usually, you know, maybe one number and uh, two letters. So what were the ones we wanted? UKE, I think was one of them. Uh, let's see, where are the U's? 6A. B, D, K, uh, U, here we go, there we are. So um, U, K, E, or U, E, 1, I think was another one, right? Right here, so uh, if it's got GPS, right? Uh, where's U, K something? U, K, 3, here we go. This is what's really important for this one, I think why the wiring diagram is different, that UK1, uh, or UK3 rather, identifies that this vehicle has a steering wheel controls for the accessories. And so on that vehicle, let's go back to our wiring diagram. Diagrams, electrical, and information bus was down here somewhere, right? And we're on the low speed. Let me zoom that in a little bit, right? Uh, if the vehicle has those options, right? Steering wheel controls, then these things are all gonna be wired right into, um, oh, where are we? And I gotta back out again. passenger presence and inflatable restraint. And I think, you know, that's affected by the clock spring in the steering column is different depending on uh, what options the car has as far as steering wheel controls. Anyhow, when you see something like this on a wiring diagram, you know, bunch of options or minus those options gives you two different options. This, this car either has, uh, you know, this wiring, where there's a splice, or it has this wiring, depending on whether it has these options or doesn't have the options. And I told you, star configuration, everything comes back to a central point, right? That central point being essentially right here. Now, if you move on to the high speed, Right. And we want to remember, OK, I, I suspect some of the modules or computers that were on the low speed network are also going to be on the high speed network. Hopefully your memory is better than ours, than mine, somebody's. Well, here's one. OK, body control module. We saw that on the low speed network and we also are seeing it on the high speed network. This network is different. This network is uh, configured in what's known as a ring topology. Notice, all right, that the engine control module is sort of at the end of a line. Uh, there's two wires, right, going in one side of the transmission control module and coming out the other side, right? And then they go to the electronic brake control module, and then that goes to the body control module. Right, and then that goes over to the vehicle communications interface module, maybe. Uh, you know, we have different options here, right? Maybe we have it, maybe we don't, splices. 
And then they do go to pin six and 14 of the data link connector. So if you plug into six and 14 of the data link connector, um, you're going to be accessing all of these modules. And like I told you before, uh, the BCM at least is on both networks. So, you know, everything can talk to everything else if they want it to. So what's a ring configuration? I think that I have a slide here. Let's see. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is kind of okay. Um, what it's showing, all right, is you have a module here connected to a module there, you know, and then connected up to a module there. And the problem with the ring configuration, let me go back to somewhere where I have some room to work. Uh, so the ring configuration, let me just draw this for a second. There's one computer, there's another computer, there's another computer, you know, what do we want to name these? Uh, we'll say that this is the, uh, you know, the electronic control module, right? Or engine control module. We'll say this is the electronic brake control module. And we'll say this is the uh, body control module, all right? And, and then, We'll make connections between these, right? Ring configuration. Uh, I don't know what just happened there. I guess I deleted everything I just drew. Let me do that again. Uh, so there's one, two. That's why I keep it simple in case I screw up like that. Label them again. I think I said uh, engine control module, electronic brake control module, and sometimes electronic brake and and traction control, EBTCM, and we'll say the body control module. And then I will attempt again uh, to connect them. All right, we're gonna pretend those lines actually touch. Uh, actually, maybe we can make them touch, right? There we go. And then our line here, and our line here. that critter over all right good deal so and, and oh of course then we need uh we need pin six and we need pin 14 of the data link connector absolutely here's pin six here's pin 14. this way we our scan tool can access uh, this network and all of these so notice there's two wires on this. And in each, um, inside each end module here, okay, is a terminating resistor that is 120 uh, ohms, 120. And this is a parallel circuit. If you put an, an ohm meter across pins six and 14, if everything's good, you'll read 60. Uh, if something's broken, you'll read 120. That, in one of the videos from last year on the YouTube channel, the AU-273 channel, I explain that I show you two resistors in parallel uh, and I have them on a bench and I have a camera on it. So I'm not gonna try to re-explain that. I'm just gonna suggest that you watch that, right? So I'm gonna show you this on the diagram too, but here's the problem with uh, this type of network. One, it has a lot more wires, right? Because look at the EBCM, right? It has four pins, one, you know, one, two, three, four pins connected to the network, uh, where on the low speed one, there was one connecting back to a central point. The other problem is if, if the connection between the brake control module and the body control module is severed, then the ECM maybe also can't talk to the BCM. On the other, uh, on the star configuration, everything has its own separate connection back to a central point. You know, so if that central point fails, well, then everything's down. But uh, other than that, only one module would drop off the network. So let me go back to the diagram, the actual diagram. 
And I'm going to show you. Uh, here's that 20, 120 ohm resistor right here. This is at one end of the network. And the other 120 ohm resistor is over here at the other end of the network. So with, with an ohm meter, like I was saying, with an ohm meter right here at pins 6 and 14, if you show 60 ohms, your wiring is good. You show anything other than that, you got a problem. So it's a really quick, simple check. Here's back to my slides. And the reason I have this slide is I, I just want to show you, well, a couple things. First, notice uh, some, some words that are on here, right? SAE J1962 data link connector. So I think I told you before in another uh, series, another video, Society of Automotive Engineer has standards. J1962 is the standard for automotive data link connectors. That came out in the mid nineties. Okay, some more words, right? The ISO 9141 K line. Uh, ISO is International Standards Organization. 9141 is a type of network. There was the K line and the L line. Um, so sometimes you'll see uh, you'll see that. And our little launch scan tool, when you plug it in, it runs through all these different types of networks. CAN, ISO 9141, you know. Uh, various um, variable pulse width ones, and it, and when it finds one that it likes, then it can talk to the computers. This is kind of the thing I brought this slide up for, though. You'll see this a lot. If we bring up a Chrysler in the shop, a late model Chrysler, and we use YTEC, we can uh, see this a little more graphically. And I think we some of us have done that in the shop, some have not. But this CAN gateway, they're showing the PCM as a gateway. A lot of times on Chrysler's, it's the tip of the totally integrated power module. Um, and it is the gateway to the scan tool, to the data link connector. So all the other networks come into it. And then the scan tool can access, uh, you know, medium speed CAN, low speed CAN, high speed CAN, whatever. They can access all of those through this CAN gateway, which is a member of every network in the car. So going back to uh, that concept right from the wiring diagram, you go back to that, uh, where we saw this, you know, body control module, I think. So BCM right there, right, right here. We saw that on the low speed can, and we also found it on the high speed can, where is it? So, you know, this is an example of, of a, a module or a computer that's on both networks. So something like that could be a gateway for the scan tool. And it's not on this car, but it has access to both networks. These, this car, you know, the high speed CAN network is accessed on pin six and 14 by the scan tool. And of course the low speed one was on pin, what was it? Uh, find it pin 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 one right right there on the data link connector so that goes to all these computers well it occurs to me that i'm getting kind of sick of talking here um i i think we've covered kind of a lot hopefully the uh you know relays and and data streams those are two big things next week we'll just cover the motors Ignition coils ought to take like two minutes. Uh, and as far as motors, we have regular DC motors, like fuel pumps and uh, you know electronic throttle controls. And then we have stepper motors, which are, they're not used a lot, um, but you should understand what they are and how they work. So we'll do that next week. Uh, so when I get that lecture done next week, I will be announcing your second test. Um, which I'll post pretty much at the same time as next week's lecture, but you'll have plenty of time to get that done. And I'm I'm sure you won't wait till the last minute because that really never happens, right? So uh, no surprises. I don't spring 
you know, tests on people without giving you time to to prepare for it. Just don't get really too far behind in the videos. You'll be good because the test will test you on things right up till the very last video that we that I've posted. So I'll see you out in the shop. Uh, if you have questions, ask me the questions. Otherwise, you'll you won't get the answers. If you want to see one of the demos I mentioned, right? Because here's what happens sometimes. The Monday morning lab, I'm just for an example, nobody has anything to do. So I have a demo, I show something, and then the Monday afternoon lab comes along just as an example, and somebody brings in a car that has a really interesting problem. And so that takes over, takes precedence over this uh, demo that I did in the morning lab. And semester ends and I realized the afternoon people never saw that demo. So everybody should have seen um, my little demonstration on uh, solenoids. I used a vacuum pump. I used a, a power source. We looked at, you know, opening and closing them right there, you know, in the shop. Uh, and I did a demo on relays where we used a nine volt battery just to open and close, you know, turn on the relay on and off. And we did a quick little uh, worksheet on it out in the shop. So if you haven't done that, I really encourage you to do that so that you really understand what I just, all the stuff I just showed you over the last two videos, it, it should be pretty helpful. There's a solenoid worksheet. Um, a lot of you have done, some of you have not, because like I said, a nice interesting problem comes in the door and we kind of would really rather work on those than uh, than to do these worksheets. So that's what happens sometimes. So look at that kind of stuff. And uh, again, don't forget. Uh, really important. Let me just uh, let me just bring this up a minute. This. Um, this batch of videos. I just want to remind you, right? Um, I have stuff from engine performance. I have all of the videos from this semester so far, right? They're all here. Um, I have air conditioning stuff. If you're interested, some of it's a little better than others. Here's engine performance stuff. That's all out there. It's all publicly available. Feel free. You know, I have people have subscribed that are not students with you guys. So um just you just have to search au 273 you'll find it feel free to share it uh, some of it you know i talked directly to you guys a little specifically and it wouldn't really apply to anybody else but uh a lot of it from last year fits this lab this uh, lecture number one from 11 months ago solenoids you know I did some stuff uh, and then I shared some other YouTube videos I found on there. So it's it's worth a watch if you're not really understanding what we've talked about so far. So that's it for this week. I'll see you in lab. Um, if you watch this before Monday, uh, you know, you'll know that uh, I have to leave early Monday in the for the morning lab and I have to show up late for the afternoon lab. I have something right in the middle of the day that I can't miss. So, um, you know, you maybe you haven't seen this. Maybe Monday's already come and gone by the time you watch this, but maybe not. So I'll see you in the lab. We only have a few weeks left to get